if you start by selling things, products and offers, and then you graduate to a place where you're selling mindset and you're not selling stuff anymore, that's when you've fallen into the trap of being a marketer and not actually right. having an offer to sell. A marketer of the self, right? Really what you're selling is you. Welcome to Marketing Muckraking, the show that asks not simply what brand culture can do for us, but what it's doing to us. With your host, creative director and brand strategist gone wild, Rachel K. Albers, making fun of business and making business fun. This is the show for rebels, revolutionaries, and renegades who run businesses that burn the rule book. If you're sick of business podcasts that have all the answers, well, I got nothing but questions. Let's go. Episode 26, Six Figure Masterminds, Marie Forleo, and The Syndicate, The Online Business Family Tree, Part 2. Welcome to Part 2 of this four-part series on the Online Business Family Tree, where we trace back how we arrived at this moment in internet marketing and online business, and who are the key leaders who brought us here. In this installment, we're diving into Six Figure Masterminds, Marie Forleo's B-School, the cult of the syndicate, and how early internet marketers like Mark Joyner, Dan Kennedy, Yannick Silver, and Russell Brunson brought mind control and manipulation online. If you don't know or care about these names, never fear, we focus on what tactics these leaders popularized and how they've invaded nearly every celebrity online business course, including Matthew McConaughey's. Remember, this stuff didn't start on the internet. It goes back hundreds of years. To understand marketing history is to understand ourselves and our culture, because marketing is the fuel for the engine of capitalism. So, so let's take a trip through time again so you can be a more informed consumer and hopefully a more ethical marketer. My guest, Lisa Robin Young, has 30 years of business experience as a coach and creative entrepreneur. She is an award-winning speaker, best-selling author, and accomplished musician with multiple albums to her credit. You may even recognize her from the Disney Plus show Encore. She is also the host of the Creative Freedom Show, and Lisa specializes in helping creative entrepreneurs build a business that works for how you're wired to work. Now let's dig into part two. So we've gotten our way from the prosperity gospel, myth of meritocracy, kind of turn of the 20th century ethos and how that led to masterminds, right? And as you said, we've got all of these, you know, captains of industry glamping with the muskrats in their millions and presidents are hanging out with them. And then yep. we start to look around at each other and say, hmm. Hmm, I think we could make some more money off of this. And so what, what happened next? Well, um, you know, we talked a little bit about Dan Kennedy and his bringing people together. And this is the thing about masterminds, right? Like the original premise of a mastermind was these were all people who had a vested interest in supporting and working with one another. And it wasn't a monetized thing. But then we get the age of the internet marketer and it's everything is monetizable. And so how do we make money from this? How do we make money from this? And so you've got guys like Yannick Silver and Marie Forleo and Joe Polish going off to Necker Island with Richard Branson to hang out for a few days and learn at his feet and you know talk about what they're doing and stimulate conversations with one another. They're not paying Joe or Yannick or Marie or Richard Branson to be in a facilitated group. They paid their way to get to the island. They got an invitation from Branson to come but then they're there and they're talking amongst themselves and cross-pollinating these ideas, great ideas for them, right? Oh, let's see. I want to do something like this for my people, but if I'm going to be the leader of it, then they should pay me to do it. Let's do that, right? And I'm interested in Marie Forleo because she comes from, she's one of those people that's like been cross-pollinated in a lot of different ways. So she studied with Allie Brown for several years before Allie Brown went her way. And then Marie stepped away from her. And that was when I kind of started to latch onto Marie and what was Marie was doing because I was really more in alignment with where she was headed at the time. And she was connected to Yannick Silver because there was this whole East Coast group of internet marketers, right? So Yannick Silver and Gary Vee and Marie Forleo and several other people were all on that coast so they could spend time with each other. They could get to know each other. They could appear on each other's video shows and YouTube channels and you know at their events and all of this stuff. 
And so they start holding their own events for their people to get that high ticket thing. Allie Brown had launched her diamond level mastermind and it was a six figure investment for a year long program. And I knew a copywriter who had been hired into that program later on once it had been run for a few years and it was, there were several tiers. And she was like, when I came into the program, they told me, oh, we've really got to step up our game at Diamond because, you know, you're bringing your A game. And she's like, well, did you expect I wouldn't? Like, I don't understand, right? So so we're seeing these people trying to monetize this access, right, at this very high level, and it trickles down. And so there are people start trying to do masterminds, and there are people start trying to do math, and there are people start trying to do masterminds. And for some of them, it works well, and for some of them, it doesn't because of what they are or aren't delivering. But that's kind of where it all came from. But the thing that made it work were these JV relationships. Right. So that's number three. So we go prosperity gospel to masterminds to JV relationships where the powerful people get in the room with each other. And then they say, oh, we could make a lot more money if we support each other's offers, right? So now we haven't paid to be in the room, but now that we're in the room, how do we leverage this? Let's leverage our relationships with each other. You've Mm -hmm. got an audience that I don't have. I have an audience that you don't have. What if we support each other's offers and we both make a cut. So one piece of this is turning the free mastermind, turning the unpaid experience of just going with a group of your peers to learn from each other, which isn't inherently bad, right? Like that's a valuable thing to do. I've been in a lot of peer led masterminds where nobody's paying to be there. We all bring something else to the table and we're learning from each other, right? Right. That's how it begins. Then they get in the room together because here's what happened. Like you said, the press was there in the later iterations of Henry Ford glamping in the woods with presidents and muskrats, right? The press comes and they're looking at it. And now the world is looking and saying, ooh, I wish I could be in the room where it happens or the tent where it happens, right? So then there's an opportunity to create a paid experience where you're paying for access. That's one thing. But yeah. then what that becomes and turns into is how can we who are in the room where it happens make money off of our relationships with each other? And that's where JV partners come from. I just want to make sure I'm getting the sequence down before you start dropping all the juicy nuggets. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the lesser known, but more pivotal, I think JV relationship communities, that's a loose term I'm going to use, was actually called the syndicate. And this is something that doesn't get talked about a whole lot. And this was a group of folks that included Frank Kern. And I'm pretty sure Yannick Silver was in it for a little while. But I mean, that level of seven and eight figure mastermind marketer people all in a group. And they would set their marketing calendars and they would coordinate with one another. Well, you're promoting in June, so I won't promote till July. Well, you're promoting in July, so then I'll I'll promote the first couple of weeks of August so that they always were pitching somebody else's stuff to their list. Every month they had something. And so that's where these JV leaderboards came from. And the standard was... 50%, right? Because I'm a multimillionaire. I'm not doing this for a $10 commission. Like I want half because I've got a hundred thousand people on my list. Or in the case of Mark Joyner, I've got a million people on my list and I'm not going to just market to get 10 bucks ahead. I want half. And that's when people started jacking the prices of their programs to $2,000, $3,000 because they had to give half of that back to their super affiliates, their JV partners who were cross pollinating to their lists. And that became the industry standard of, well, it's a 50% commission. And so when 10 years ago, when I had this wave of new entrepreneurs coming into the online space, they were like, why should I give up half of my money? I'm like, you really shouldn't. But that's what the industry has said is the standard. So you either have to double the price or you have to tell people you're only going to pay 10% and you're not going to get as many people in the door. And that's a choice you have to to decide on as, as a person who wants to run an affiliate program. It's one of the reasons why I stopped doing affiliate programs for a very long time. I might change my mind, but right now I'm not doing it because I didn't like the idea of inflating the price, inflating the value just so that somebody else would think I was worthy of their time to promote. Like you either like my stuff or you don't. Like if you don't, then don't. This isn't about the dollar bills. It's about helping the right people get the results that they need so that they can go have enoughness, live their lives, run their businesses and make a better impact in the world. Yeah. And 
what we're seeing here is, and this is why it's so hard to, to truly map out a family tree, because it's not as easy as saying Tony Robbins begat Kutcher who begat whatever, right? It's all overlapping circles of a, the world's most fucked up Venn diagram, because we've gone from prosperity gospel to masterminds to JV, also known as joint venture partnerships, right? So when we're using this internet shorthand, I forget that there might be people like JV, what's that? People don't talk about JV partnerships as much these days as they did when I got into the game in 2008, 2009. But JV refers to joint venture partnerships and then joint venture partnerships leads to affiliate programs. Can you help discern what's the difference between a JV partnership and an affiliate program? Yeah. So today there's less of a difference between the two. Back in the early, the early Wild West days of the interwebs, you would go to these people in your mastermind and you would do a joint venture partnership with them saying, hey, you're basically going to be a super affiliate. I'm going to lean on you to bring your list to my offer and I'm going to give you half. And what happened was people who had purchased these programs, people who were invested in getting success from these programs, were seeing these people making all this money going, I'd like to get a piece of that. I mean, I can actually speak to what's good about this program and I would like to get a cut. And they're like, oh, that's a great way to bring in more revenue, but I'm not paying you 50%. I'll give you 20 or 25 or 10, right? Mm -hmm. And so then they had your super affiliates who are often your JVs. And sometimes a JV was actually two people collaborating on a project together. One of the examples that I like to use is Lisa Sasevich, who was known for years as the queen of sales conversion because she came out of a relationship coaching organization and she was their master salesperson and she could like sell water to fish and she was just that good. And Allie Brown met her at one of those coaching events and said, you're really good. I would love to do something with you. My list could really use your sales knowledge. And so she created the content. Allie brought the list and they created this program called Simply Irresistible Together. And, you know, for years, everybody thought, you know, Allie did this, created this big thing and it was so fabulous. But Lisa was the one who created the content. Allie had already developed this list. And so they worked, they partnered together and then split the proceeds of, you know, whatever they had created together. That was the original original intention of a JV, but it really ended up becoming super affiliate. Right. So the intention of a JV is two or more business leaders come together to create a program using both of their knowledge, right? It's supposed to be about, I'm bringing a little bit of my, I, you know, my stuff. Now in Lisa and Allie Brown's case, it was Lisa bringing the knowledge and Allie bringing the marketing and the brand. And the audience. Cause, cause Lisa was a brand new internet marketer at this point, just starting to build her list. Because Allie had told her, hey, there's this great world called internet marketing where you can make a lot of money and not have to have this day job anymore. Right. Isn't that the dream that everyone's being sold? Right, right. right. And Lisa's like, tell me more. And she's like, well, I've got a list of people and we do these monthly calls and I would love for you to come talk about it and see if it goes well. And now we then we can do a program together. And, you know, the program was like $1,500, $1,800, somewhere in that ballpark, right? So that's good money when you're splitting it 50-50 and you've got 12,000, 10,000, 5,000 people signing up for it. Okay, so here's another difference between the JV model and the affiliate model, which is with the JV model, no matter who's bringing in the lead, you're still splitting the cost. You're still splitting the, the, the revenue, right? Right. In a true joint venture, there weren't other affiliates funneling sales in. It was just the two of them working together to promote it. The second time it would launch, then you'd have, you know, your super affiliates and your affiliates and, and it's priced at $750 and, you know, half that goes to your, your super affiliate partners and then you'd split the other half that was left right okay um and and so again you get people who've been in the program and i'd like to get a piece of that and well okay let's figure out how to do this and that's where affiliate software started becoming a thing because before that it was all tracked manually because you only had five or ten people promoting it well now you've got an army of clients right. who want to promote this we need a way to manage this so you know one shopping cart and infusion soft and and all those guys come into the game and this is how the JV turned affiliate model really echoes and is similar to the pyramid scheme MLM network marketing model. Because if jo joint venture model is about two, three, or four leaders all splitting the profits together, but that's 
it, right? Like they're all yeah. splitting it and that's it. The affiliate model is now we've got this growing audience of people who want a little piece of what we have, who are mm -hmm. recommending us to their friends. Mm -hmm. How do we further incentivize them to continue recommending us to their friends? We're going to give them a little cut. Well, we're going to give them a little cut and we're going to put them in the running with all of the big names on the leaderboard mm -hmm. to incentivize them to sell more seats in our program so that they too could win, have the shot at winning the car, which they hardly ever do have a shot at winning the car because right. they don't have a hundred thousand dollars or a hundred thousand right. name list. Right. And so then you get that grumbling of there's no way we can compete with those guys. And that's when you start to see people like Marie Forleo back off on affiliate marketing and say, well, I'm only going to have select people promote the program from here on out. Canva's doing a big change right now too. They're like, we're only going to allow influencers with X number of audience who actually do Canva specific content be affiliates. And I'm like, that's a shame because I'm a coach and we use a lot of Canva and I refer a lot of people to Canva and now I'm not going to be able to do that for the kickback that I would get, right? Now I have to do it because I either believe in the program or I don't. And I believe in it. That's the whole reason I recommend it in the first place, but it's nice to have a little bit of coffee money sometimes. And now they're saying, nope, we're only going for the big fish. Right. And not only that, I think you were showing me some of Canva adjusted affiliate guidelines in order to qualify to affiliate for Canva now, not only do you have to self-identify as an influencer or content creator, but you have to be producing like a minimum of X amount of posts or, or pieces of content about Canva per month. So now they're going to say, not, no, you can't just organically mention this in your programs or to the clients that it would be useful for we need you doing the unpaid labor of doing yes. our marketing for us because that's the other piece of the affiliate model that yes. makes the folks at the top of the funnel, the top of the pyramid rich is that they're able to, instead of me warming up a brand new person, a brand new lead from scratch, mm -hmm. I'm going to piggyback on you and your existing trust with your audience. Mm -hmm. And instead of spending a bunch of money on ads and a bunch of time and energy warming up a cold lead, lead, you've already warmed up that lead. They already trust you. So if you say, Hey, you should do Marie Forleo's B school. Well, then I just saved a ton of money and right. also potentially a ton of turnover, uh, warming you up from scratch. I don't have to pay for those ads. I've just advertised through somebody that already has a, a list of people that trust them. Bing, bang, boom. And that's part of why they split it 50, 50, because it's cheaper to split it 50, 50 than it is to pay. And not only just to pay for ads, but to nurture a cold lead from scratch. It's, it's longer to do that. It's more expensive to do that. I'd rather just split the cut with Jenna Kutcher or Laura Belgrade or whoever the hell else is yeah. affiliating for me. Well, and there was a time when Marie really stood on with pride, the fact that she wasn't oh. running ads. Like I don't need to run ads. Right. Our affiliate program is great. We don't need to. And then there was a tipping point because her affiliates started running ads so that they could get in front of more people so that they could get some money from the work that they were doing. And then she was like, okay, well, here's some approved ad copy and here's some approved ad content. Here are some approved ad images that you can use. And people started using it. So she wasn't running ads and she wasn't paying for it, but her people were. Her affiliates were. Her affiliates were running the ads for her. What an evil, genius, terribly effective, terribly effective. approach. Right. Yes, terribly effective approach. I wish I could have other people pay for my ads. Wouldn't that be fabulous? So that's, there's so many elements here because one, it is the, the cross pollination of audiences. The, I am going to get in front of a brand new audience that doesn't know me yet. And I'm going to piggyback onto the, to the relationship that you have with them. There's that piece. There's also the piece that we called out earlier. You called out earlier, which is within this model, it requires the person selling the course, the program, whatever to massively inflate the price so they can afford to give 50% or even 25 or 30%. And like you said, for what makes this so ineffective for the people they're teaching it to is if I am just an itty bitty micro small business owner, and I've got a program of my program of my own to sell, and I don't have a list of hundreds of thousands, and I don't have famous affiliates who are going to hammer their audiences for the next three weeks about why they should buy it. I can't actually afford to give away 50% of the revenue right. that I'm getting from this program. And yet the industry pressure is that that's what you 
you do. And so I see folks trying to emulate that B school model or fill in yep. the blank, right? Because so yep. many programs, you've got the Digital Course Academy, DCA has its own affiliate model. You've got Impacting Millions has its own affiliate model or did yep. at one time, may not be currently doing it that way, but then they launch their courses, right? Mm -hmm. And then they're trying to, they're, they go to their friends and say, hey, will you affiliate for me? And they're splitting it 50-50. They can't actually afford to do it. They don't get the volume that they need for right. it to actually be profitable for them. And then there we go again with them feeling like, oh, it must be that my program is crap. It must be that I'm bad at what I do. It must be that, no, it's that this model only works if one, you've got a massive audience already and you already have the no like trust factor. Two, you're connected to influential, powerful people that also have that level of scale, right? right. And then on and on we go. So we've got the JV partnerships and correct me if I'm wrong, but when it comes back to B-School, wasn't B-School originally a JV partnership and it's original? Yes. Yeah. Well, tech, eh, this is a tricky wicket, right? So the, the very origin of B-School started with Marie Forleo's Adventure Mastermind right? There were elements of Marie's mastermind modules that she had taken from that. And she was like, I don't want to do a year long thing. I want to do something, you know, that's a little more quick and dirty, right? Something that's easier. Emphasis dirty. <laughs> right. Well, she had done some live events and, you know, she had met up with Laura, Laura Roder. Um, Laura Roder, right? So she hooked up with Laura Roder, who was great with the tech piece. And mm -hmm. she's like, I want to create this online course program kind of thing with some live pieces, but you know, a lot of training. And so that's where Rich, Happy and Hot B-School came from. So the content, the bulk of the content had originally come from her adventure mastermind. And then she parlayed it into this six week program with Laura. Laura at some point is like, I would really like to do me Edgar and go my own separate way. And so Marie bought her out and that was her own program. But when the two of them were in it together, Laura did the tech, Laura did some of the, the business strategy stuff, but the bulk of that kind of stuff really came from Marie. But like how to build a website and what to put on your website and all that stuff, that was all Laura. So it was a partnership. And Laura got to the point where she's like, I'm ready to be done. And Marie's like, okay. And now we're going to drop the rich, happy, and hot part of the branding because I want to elevate my appearance as someone who is more elegant, more refined. I'm not that gangster of love, as she used to call herself, you know, back in the day, right? I'm For not anybody that, that doesn't anymore. remember, there used to be a picture at the bottom of Marie Forleo's website where she had a grill and chains, okay? And I feel like it's just important to remember the gangster phase of Forleo's <laughs> evolution that she would love for us to forget so right well and I think too I think this is an important lesson for for everybody that we all evolve right and we can choose to evolve for better or for worse as the case may be and so when you look at where she used to be to where she is now she's made choices to to shift her brand in a different direction from where that was and we all have the ability to do that that's why I love your post about you know you don't want Marie Forleo's website because you don't you want something that really represents who you are. And so she's made this choice to go in this other direction. And this new direction is how she ends up on the radar of, you know, Tony Robbins and Frank Kern and, and all of that. And, you know, the, the new money masters and that whole thing, which then paves the way to Matthew McConaughey. And like, there's this long, rich tapestry of all roads leading. And that's why it's so incestuous, right? Like, Frank was sending spam emails and he made a killing selling spam emails at a time when it wasn't illegal, but it was really annoying. And then he went to a Tony Robbins event and Tony Robbins was really impressed with him. And he was like, hey, you really need to get on this internet marketing thing. And Tony's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And then the whole new money masters thing came out and, oh, you should interview not just me, but Marie Forleo and some of these other people who are making a killing online. And oh, how can I get involved with this, right? And so that whole world blows up. And that's why we recently saw this whole Matthew McConaughey thing happen because Matthew had previously, you know, been a, a student of Tony's and traveled in that celebrity world that Tony travels in from time to time. And I'm sure, I'm this is speculation on my part, I'm sure he turned to him and said, how do we blow this thing up? Because this is the thing I really want to do. And he tapped his... He tapped his JV network and said, hey, guys, would you like to have Matthew McConaughey on your show? 
because he's doing this thing. And they were like, where do I sign? It's a real bona fide celebrity. Of course I want him on my show. And for those of you who aren't aware, what we're talking about is the fact that Matthew McConaughey re- recently launched his own life coaching program school. It was called Highway. It is called Highway to More Road Trip with Matthew McConaughey. I'm not doing a very good Matthew McConaughey voice. I'm going to have to refine that character because he really deserves his own <laughs> awkward marketing. But so Matthew McConaughey got in to the Tony Robbins network because all roads really do lead back to Tony Robbins, at least in the last like 25, 30 years. And so Tony, he partnered with Tony and Marie and Dean Graciosi to help him kind of build out the curriculum for this. And so, like you said, they're using him to, you know, reinforce their own celebrity. And he's tapping into them to get access to this audience of people who are hungry for personal development and life coaching and all that good stuff. But let's back up the truck because we just dropped a lot of names. I'm sure that a lot of people aren't familiar with all of this. So let's slow it down because for you and me, we see all of it. We've got like the conspiracy theory wall, you know, in our own brains and everyone else is just trying to, to catch up with us. So we were talking about how early joint venture partnerships some of them were between existing successful business people, but what you're kind of nodding to, which is very troubling for me, is in a lot of cases, you've got one powerful person that has an audience, but doesn't actually have a lot of good things to say, or, or just doesn't necessarily have all the knowledge they need to back it up. Partnering, doing a JV, a joint venture partnership with someone that can really bring the thunder when it comes to knowledge and business acumen. And so the brand, the face of the brand is kind of tapping into the wisdom of an entrepreneur that doesn't have a huge following and their partner together and splitting the proceeds. Well, and, and it's Moneyball. And it's Moneyball. And then what became out of that, so uh, if we are going to say about things begetting something, if we are going to take the family tree approach, masterminds begat JV relationships, begat affiliates. And that's how we got from Laura Roder and Marie Forleo partnering to deliver Rich, Happy, and Hot, which ultimately turned into B-School. And then that turned into B-School season. Because for a while there, now it has changed, but for a while there, you could kind of set your watch to February of every year is when all of the online business leaders are going to start sending relentless emails telling you about B-School. And all of them are competing with each other because when B-School was really in its heyday, everybody was competing. Who has got the best bonuses? Who are you buying B-School from? Bonus shopping. Laura Belgray's got her. If you buy B-School, I'm going to throw in a one hour webinar with me and I'm going to throw in my copywriting, you know, PDFs and I'm going to throw in this. And Amy Porterfield's over here saying, well, if you buy it through me, you're going to get this, you're going to get my course. You know, let's just remember that Amy Porterfield's trajectory, which is super interesting, was starting working with Tony Robbins. And when she came out the gate, she branded herself as the Facebook girl. She was a Facebook expert and she rode that for a while. And then that parlayed into social media in general. She's just going to teach you about the social media lab. I think I think I had a client. We went in on that together. We, we bought that together, her social media lab. And then the social media lab turned into online marketing maybe. So, so Amy kind of worked her way up the ladder from the Facebook girl to the social media person to now the queen of online marketing, right? Lewis Howes did the same thing. He started as a sports guy, an injured sports guy who has basically had no career left. Let's, let's leverage LinkedIn. And he became this LinkedIn guy and then it was webinars and now he's, you know, school of greatness. So, and I, and Hey, I don't begrudge anybody's evolution. Like go for it, go for it. And recognize the trajectory. Like if, if you start by selling things, right, products and offers, and then you graduate to a place where you're selling mindset and you're not selling stuff anymore, that's when you've fallen into the trap of being a marketer and not actually right. having an offer to sell. A marketer of the self. 
right? Really what you're selling is you. So there's a few things that are important here. One, if we go back to, you mentioned my, my article, you don't want Marie Forleo's website. I wrote that in like 2016, right when she had just done a new redesign. This redesign now has gone away. She's got a new website. She's got a new, new website right now. But that was the website where she like walked onto the screen before video headers were a thing. And she's wearing that black and white dress and she's out of focus. And then she comes into the focus. And at the top of the page, the world needs that special gift that only you have. And all of these people were coming to me. I, If I had a nickel for every person who came to me and said, can you copy Marie Forleo's website? Well, I wouldn't be making this podcast because I would be at, on my own island that you could pay to access. I'm kidding, JK, I'll always be a muckraker. But okay, all these folks were coming to me and they're saying, I want you to design a website and I want you to design me a marketing plan to copy Marie Forleo's. Not only is that not a smart business strategy, copy, copying somebody, you want to be somebody else's knockoff? right? You want to be the Marie Forleo knockoff or you want to be your own brand. Please don't build a brand off of trying to be the cheaper, more accessible version of something, but you know, something else, something that you're aspiring to look like. But the other more important reason why that strategy doesn't work is because you're trying to emulate a business model that's already at like the third or fourth step in the game. Marie, as we've just outlined, didn't start at the B school level. She didn't start with Marie TV. She didn't start start by being like an everything is fi figure outable inspo porn account for people who just want ideas on how to like, you know, take back their time. She started by doing well, she started by doing like aerobics classes where she had you sign up on a yellow notepad. Yeah, you know, she was a emails. Nike dance athlete and bartended and worked at Condé Nast publications and you know, I think she graduated top of her class or very near it at, from Seton Hall and worked in, you know, the stock market. She was on the floor at Merrill Lynch, I think. So, you know, I mean, she's a very smart person in, in that respect. And she's had several iterations and evolutions. And so many of us, and this is where I'm going to get a little bit, get, get a little bit philosophical. So many of us are looking at somebody else's highlight reel and we're comparing it to our everyday and going, what's wrong with me? There's nothing wrong with you. You're not at that step yet. And you really need to own the fact that this is the step that you're on. And and maybe that's the path you need to take. And maybe it's not, but be clear on where you're at before you start trying to chart a course towards you know, that special gift that only you can bring. Yeah. And that also brings up, not only are you not on that step yet, but the whole foundation of capitalism is built on the idea that we can't all, we can't all be millionaires. We can't all effectively copy the Marie Forleo way and just work our way up the ladder. Marie Forleo is who she is because of the thousands of people who bought into her model, who lifted her up to that point. But all of us can't, you know, become B-school celebrities in our own right. There are systemic barriers to that. There are economic, the, the economic system does not facilitate that. I think going back to my original point here is that, you know, you can't copy somebody else's formula, right? You're looking at somebody's high, highlight reel and, and you said it, you're looking at them seven steps down the line after, like you said, Condé Nast, New York Stock Exchange, top of her class, has connections at MTV, had her own like line of workout videos, right? This is the advantage. These are the advantages that Marie Forleo was coming into the game with, let alone the fact that probably her number one advantage was that she was one of the early adopters of the internet marketing game. None of us can replicate that. If you didn't put up your first squeeze page in 2008, 2009, there's no way that you'll ever be able to replicate the results of the folks that were just happened to be in the room where it happened at the right time in the right moment in history. And so, so much of their success really comes down to that. And they don't credit that. So whether it's- well, And some of it was legal then and it isn't legal now, right? Like, I mean- Frank Kern says on his about page, you know, I, I made a killing sending spam basically. And it wasn't illegal then. Like he puts all the asterisks around it. Like that makes it better or something. Well, it wasn't illegal then. Okay. But it was still shady and questionable and, and not in integrity for somebody who wants to be about having an ethical business or as ethical as it can be under capitalism. And you use that as an advantage. And I will say, we all come to the table with a different advantage if we're willing to look at ourselves and really examine what our advantages are, but not every advantage is equal, right? So as a person who's mixed race, I come to the table with that knowledge and that advantage because I can look at both sides of that color wheel and go, look, patriarchy in heels and patriarchy in dark skin is just as prevalent as it is in the white space. 
And that's something that somebody else may not be able to say because of where they fall on that spectrum. As a person who's got 30 years in business, I've got that as an advantage that somebody who's just starting out, who's, who's celebrating their third year in business and has never had a down year. And they're just so cute at this age, right? It's like, oh, honey, it's coming because business is cyclical. And if you haven't had a down year yet, it's coming. It's just the nature of the beast. And so to stand there in year three or four and be like, I've doubled my revenue every year and you can too. You haven't had a hard time yet. Don't come at me with that. I just don't, right? But we need to recognize that. Yeah. I, I like how you put that, that we all have our own advantages, but not all of these advantages are equal. They don't have the same privilege. And so, so yeah, we got to look at the, some of these trajectories. We look at the Amy Porterfield trajectory from Facebook peon to queen of the online marketers. We look at Lewis House starting with his cute little LinkedIn squeeze pages. I'm going to show you how to LinkedIn. And he really focused on the sports market in the early days. And then slowly worked his way up to a level of clout where he got rid of teaching any element of the how. This is what we were talking about before, teaching yeah. the, the why and the what, but not teaching the how. He got rid of the house. And that's kind of ironic because he is Lewis House. He got rid of the house years ago, right? And now he just teaches mindset. I can't tell you the amount of people who come to me who look at leaders like this and they're teaching fluffy stuff now. They're just teaching like, how do you feel good? And like meditate your way to more money. And so when business owners look at that, or another one that I get all the time is folks who come in and they want to be the next Brene Brown, right? They're like, how can I build a brand like Brene Brown? I'm like, well, first of all, she's got a PhD, right? She's an academic. She's got years and years of research background and collaborating and, and working and creating her body of work in obscurity. Of course, she had that TED Talk. So you really want to walk the Brene Brown line? Well, get yourself to a PhD program and I'll see you in about 15 years, right? Like, let's say, right, yeah. So they look at, ooh, I want to talk about these topics. Why can't I be like Marie talking about how to get anything you want? I have all of these spiritual teachings. She didn't start there. She did not start with inspiration porn, which is now what her entire brand is, is based on. She started teaching aerobics classes with a yellow legal pad in front, getting people's names for her email list back in the day. And even that wasn't her real starting point, because as you already referenced, she went to uh, Seton Hall. She worked at the New York Stock Exchange. She worked for Condé Nast. All of those are pretty connected positions, powerful positions, even at the lowest rungs. So understanding the arc, I think, is so big. This takes us to, we've gone from the myth of the meritocracy to, and the prosperity gospel to early masterminds, which became the inspiration for the monetized mas mastermind model, pay me $50,000 to be in the room with me to sit at my feet and just soak up my goodness oh. sit in my energy I believe I heard once that Amanda Francis charged a hundred thousand dollars for people to sit in her energy okay and so you do with that what you will so then that turns it masterminds go into joint venture partnerships joint venture relationships which then turned into the affiliate model and something you touched on that I just want to return to was that that affiliate model that became so popular, ended up reaching a breaking point. Because as I was yeah. talking about B-School season, so you had February, mm -hmm. you could set your watch to everybody and their dog was sending out emails relentlessly about B-School, right? Well, that reached a saturation point. And as you said, some of the folks that started affiliating started to actually degrade the perceived value of the Forleo brand. People were sick of it. They were exhausted by it. They had seen it go around again. We could all predict it was going to happen. So Marie decided to actually back back off then. And she took away the affiliate program. And then it became only the people that I invite can, can affiliate with me. And she started running ads. And that's when she started running ads after all of those years of bragging that she never had to run an ad. My, how the mighty have fallen. But what I think I want to also just point out here is what was, you talk about harm. What was so troubling was how many businesses admitted to how many entrepreneurs, how many personal brands admitted to the fact that their entire business model had become being an affiliate for B-School. I believe I hear, I heard Hillary Rushford very famously said that she made most, if not all of her money money at one point in her business from affiliating for B-School and nothing else. So you want to talk about marketing and not actually having anything to back it up. At that point in Hillary Rushford's business model, and I know she has evolved and has kind of adapted her teachings and is now definitely what I've heard through the grapevine, I've never been a part of her programs, is that now she has been sharing with her own audience all, some of these harms of the industry. But at one point in time, Hillary Rushford's entire job was to market herself 
herself and to and her style and her lifestyle. But the only thing that she was ultimately delivering was somebody else's program, right? Was Marie Forleo's program. And there were so many people that I know that they they hung their hats, they latched their revenue directly to B school season and then being able to promote an affiliate for B school. So when Marie pulled that off, when put when Marie yanked that away, that had some serious impact. So she it was like biting the hand that fed her in a way because these are the folks that be school, right? It was through their audiences that she got, that she can now say, I think on her sales page that 80,000 businesses launched, I believe is what the B school copy. No, 80,000 people paid for the 80,000 people paid the for. completion rate is not in fact if you if I think it was the new money masters but I'm not sure don't hold me to that there was an interview that Marie did where she talked about how the refund rate and the the withdrawal rate was something like 20 or 30 percent I mean it was high and people were asking for their money back several weeks into the program because they weren't getting what they wanted out of it. And so the solution wasn't let's improve the program. It was let's set up an email campaign and a stick strategy to encourage these people to recognize that there's no behind in B school and you're right where you need to be. So just keep going and then get beyond the refund period. And then you can't get your money back. And that brought refund retention, refund rates way down and retention numbers, you know, went, went up, even though people weren't actively engaging with the program. But the other piece to that puzzle was this idea of stick strategy versus product improvement. And when she would say there's no behind in B school, that might be more true now, now that the program has evolved a bit. But in the early days, she did one call a week and then she rolled it into an eight week program where it was three weeks and an implementation week and then three weeks and an implementation week or something like that. Basically, there were two weeks that you had quote unquote off so that you could quote unquote catch up, even though there's no behind. But in those early days, when she led her call, you could only talk to her and ask questions about that week's content. So if you didn't get to that week's content and you were two or three weeks into the program, you couldn't ask about that. So you really were behind, right? That has changed from my experience and what my understanding is that has changed, but to market, anybody can do this. And this is for everybody. It doesn't matter what level you're at and there's no behind and then don't set them up for success so that they can have a real sense of I'm right where I need to be and I'm doing okay. That's a problem with the instructional design. That's a problem with the right. program. That's a problem with the person who's created that program and doesn't want to hear, you know, I'm the emperor's new clothes. Everything is great. This is so important for us to highlight here because on one hand, you've got Marie going and talking and doing interviews about how high her refund rate was. And instead of going to improve the program, she improved the marketing. She improved the email sequence to get, but not only that, not only did she turn to, like you said, stick strategy instead of instructional design, which is such a big piece here. Again, mm -hmm. this goes back to the idea that these folks aren't improving their business skills, their, their teaching skills, they're improving their marketing. But the other side of that, of her dramatically lowering her refund rate was by putting a clause in the the terms and conditions that in order to get the refund, you have to show your work, right? And you have to satisfactorily show this is a very subjective thing. That was actually in there from the very beginning, from like the very first couple of years of B-School, that clause was there. If you want a refund, we will gladly give it to you, but you've got to show your work. And that was a strategy in and of itself that was so revolutionary at the time that other people started to implement it. And, you know, it kind of became this thing in the industry for a while. Oh, that's so smart. Smart. But there were some really powerful, influential internet marketers who were like, uh, no, if I buy your thing and I don't like it, or it's not working the way you said it was supposed to, I'm not going to go through the motions of making the work happen just so that I can get my money back. You're going to give me my money back. Dave Lacani was one of those guys, rest his soul. He was like, no, that doesn't make any sense. If I want a refund and I'm within the rights of the refund period, I get my refund period. End of discussion. So that is the consumer power that any student would have. The, the example that you're giving is of somebody that had the clout and right. also also knew their rights to to invoke their rights. Right. Uh, I want to be very clear that the that those refund policies still exist. They're in most of these high level programs, and yet what ends up happening is the marketing team, the sales team has been the refund retention team because in a lot mm -hmm. of these cases, retention specialist, they've got companies whose job it is to make sure you don't get your refund. Right? Yep. Yep. They intimidate students into believing that they don't have any other. They have to do this. They I'm going to have to to do all the homework and show my work in a satisfactory way to get my refund. So never mind, I'm not going to do it. Let alone the fact that they don't
don't want to be on the shit list of the high level influential power holder yeah. like the folios of the world. So they're not going to yeah. make enough. They're not going to make any waves. Right. But this is very similar to the terms and conditions non-disparagement clause. That's the thing that they added. Then that thing was huge. And that's why I'm treading lightly around this because I was in B-School. I'm talking shit, not you, Lisa. Right, exactly. I'm just sitting here going, you go to town, Rachel, and I'll agree <laughs> with the things that are accurate and I'll just keep my mouth shut on the other things. Because of the very litigious side of what these brands become when they become corporate entities with a pleasant face, right? They become super litigious. They go after anybody who has said anything remotely negative about them in the marketplace, even if it's just something simple, like it wasn't for me, I didn't like it. Well, don't tell people you didn't like it. Like that's, you're disparaging the brand. And then they sick an army of cease and desist letters on you and you don't have the deep pockets to fight it in court. So you're like, all right, I'm just not going to say anything because I don't want to get sick. Or the emotional energy or right. all, you know, all of these things. I do a whole episode deep dive on the non-disparagement stuff and ultimately why it's, it, it's not legally enforceable, right? Like they really can't win that in court, but they bank on the fact that the little guy, that the, the student, one, doesn't have the, the energy, uh, two, doesn't have the money, three, doesn't have the awareness or doesn't know their consumer rights. Um, this is one of the biggest bees in my bonnet because if you were to look at, now I, I'm going to have to take a look at 2023 B School to see what the state of that non-disparagement clause and if she snipped it because I've heard recently that Amy very much in 2021 had that non-disparagement clause in her terms and conditions looks like she doesn't anymore. And I will take some of the credit for that. Some of my muckraking had something to do with that. But um, but yeah, if you were to read the actual, this non-disparagement clause says that you are forbidden from talking, texting, writing, emailing, communicating in any way, shape or form. They really literally put into the terms and conditions of these programs that you're not allowed to have a phone conversation with a friend where right. you talk negatively about B-School. Now, could they ever enforce that? Of course not. But this language is meant to intimidate you. Yes, exactly. And not o then you also have the added collateral effect of if everybody in the echo chamber is saying how amazing this program was, how effective it was, how, you know, you don't be the want to be the one admitting that you were the, that you didn't get to the top of the seven figure pyramid because that makes you look like a loser. And in this world of all of us marketing ourselves or the, the pressure being to market your own success, to think and grow rich to do what right. Napoleon Hill did and hitch his wagon to Henry Ford glamping with the muskrats when he was not anywhere near any million dollar muskrats. We don't want to admit that we weren't the success story. Right. It's the whole, it's the whole emperor's new clothes dilemma, right? It's like, well, if everybody else thinks he's wearing clothes, then I must be the one that, that's wrong until the child speaks up and says, Hey, y'all, he ain't got no clothes on. It's like avert your eyes. So some of my, you know, if you talk about advantages that we're bringing in, one of the advantages that I have is in this case, I never was a B-schooler, but I did work with a lot of B-schoolers. So what I know is what all of my clients have come to me and said, I took this program and I couldn't get through it. I took this program and I followed all of the steps and it didn't work for me. I took this program and I, I got behind. And then by the time I caught up, uh, all of the live calls were over. I want to tell you, here is the good uh, feedback that I can tell you about B-School, which to my knowledge, this element of the program no longer exists. All of the best reviews I ever heard about B-School, and honestly, all of the best reviews I've ever heard about any of these programs, wasn't about the teachings, wasn't about the curriculum, but it was about the community. Most of the people that I know who made money because of B-School specifically is because right. of the connections they made in the B-School Facebook group that used to exist, in the, you know, the meetups and the webinars. Yeah. So the, in the so early days, talk yeah. about, you know, this, we, they all met each other and then gave each other business. Right. JV partnerships. Right. Right. But they'll give her credit. And I remember there was a time on her sales page where one of her testimonials was about, oh, the community is so great and everybody is so supportive and, you know, they're great opportunities to make money. And then, you know, the whole Facebook kerfuffle that launched Rachel Rogers with the Facebook group and the problematic behaviors inside the group that led to the group getting shut down and, and all of that. Like then everybody was radio silent and there was no real community anymore. Now she has some community stuff, basically places where you can post comments inside the courseware itself but it's not really a community of connecting and getting right. to know people anymore because Facebook was really good at facilitating that. Whereas the courseware that she's using now doesn't. So, right. 
And what we ultimately have here, again, is going back to the fact that the biggest value provided in this program, one, was reliant on the people that built it. It was reliant on the reselling of someone else's knowledge. Going back to that JV model of you've got one powerful personal brand who partners with the brains, right? You got the face and then you got the brains and the brains is delivering the actual value and the face is delivering the marketing. Even as we trickle it, its way down into what B-School evolved into and we're talking about B-School, but honestly, these principles apply to so many of these big celebrity programs, whether it be DCA or Brendan Burchard's program or James Wedmore's program or, or the Two Comma Club, Shanna Kutcher, Jeff Walker, Donald Miller, right? Now we're naming the names. Now we're going there. But all of that shit functions almost identically to each other. And the value is in the marketing. And, and what you were saying is whether it's investing in, I'm going to pay 50% of my revenue to you because you've got me in front of your audience, or I'm going to invest in a refund prevention pro program instead of investing in improving the actual curriculum. Because my understanding of B-School is that it's largely the same as it was 10 years ago. A couple of tweaks for things like Instagram instead of Facebook and now TikTok's here. And now, you know, Squarespace has evolved so you can do more yeah, things. The six modules are pretty much the same and they've added the benefit of mentors inside the program, which is, you know, people who actually have experience, deeper knowledge in these different topic areas to help people at a level because Marie is pretty much hands off now, right? Like, and that's the dream, right? Like we all aspire to having our minions run everything so that we can just sit back and collect the cold hard cash. And while some of me is like, yeah, that's really attractive and I, wouldn't we all like that? The truth of the matter is those people are the ones that are in there doing the work. Those are the people that we should be hiring. Those are the people that need to get our dollars and they're being played money ball with because folks like Marie or Brunson or whatever, they have the audience, you know? And, you know, Brunson makes his millions and goes and buys Glazer Kennedy Insider Circle because he knows now he's got access to all those people and he can really capitalize on his expertise. And he is deeply experienced and smart about funnels. He is. For better or worse, he is. Let's back up the truck. Because yeah, we've kind of gone into the whole Allie Brown, Allie Brown begat Marie Forleo, begat Amy Forderfield and Laura Bell Gray and blah, 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 blah. We've gone into that world. You are referencing Dan Kennedy and how his, what was it called? The Glazer Kennedy Insider Circle. The Glazer Kennedy Insider Circle, which was one of those original early internet marketing masterminds, paid masterminds. What you were just talking about is the fact that Russell Brunson purchased the Glazer Kennedy Insider Circle and all of the teachings and then wove that into ClickFunnels. So I just want to back up the truck here. Yeah, yeah. So this is really, this is really interesting because we're going to bring in a whole new line of this this family tree so years and years and years ago the godfather of internet marketing if you will was mark joiner and he is ex-military he is a super bright guy he understood he wrote the book mind control marketing and he's the author of symbology and he's done some really interesting neat smart kind things and some of his students have taken that in hopes of world domination. I'll just I'll just put it that way. Now, Mark comes from old school advertising, like Jay Abraham, Ogilvy and Mather, like the old school advertising world. Whereas Dan Kennedy was direct mail marketing. So the Glazer Kennedy Insider Circle was pretty much for copywriters and marketers, and it wasn't internet based at all for years and years. And it was Yannick Silver who got him to do that. But Russ Brunson learned from Mark Joyner. Russ was one of Mark's early students. All right, so let's just back up the truck here because I want to make sure that people can pick up all of these breadcrumbs. So you're saying yeah. that Mark Joyner, business leader of yesteryear, got his start in the military world, learned a lot about psychological manipulation through the military, yeah. and then parlayed that into business teachings. So yes. Mark Joyner's over here in one world. Then we have Dan Kennedy, who you said was in the direct mail. Yeah, direct mail marketing. So those sales letters that you used to get in the mail with the yellow highlighter and it, mm -hmm. it, sometimes it would have a penny in it or whatever, like that was his world. He didn't want to have anything to do with the internet until Yannick Silver was like, hey, you're missing an opportunity here. And who's Yannick Silver? 
So if Dan Kennedy was a sleazy salesman doing his shit offline, he's a snake oil salesman, door to door bullshit, you know, sending it in the mail yep. in with yep. those mail, those highlighter messages. And then he hooks up with Yannick Silver. Who's that? So Yannick Silver was actually a student of Dan's. So Dan was totally offline. And one of the guys who was learning from him, I have to take a step back here before we can introduce Yannick. One of the guys that was learning from him was a guy named Bill Glazer. And he sold suits on the East Coast. And he loved everything that Dan was teaching and really believed that he could reach a lot more people if they created some type of a community where copywriters could get together and, and learn, you know, these strategies and they do seminars. And so that's where the Glazer Kennedy insider kind of community became. And it wasn't online. No, it was not online. It was all offline. You went to a meeting just like, you know, any other network like BNI or whatever. And so Yannick Silver was a, a young copywriter, marketer type guy who was just starting to get his feet wet in internet and went to one of these meetings. Now, Yannick's connected to Marie, Yannick's connected to uh, Frank Kern, Yannick is connected to a lot of the internet marketers, Joe Polish, like all those guys, are. they're all that East Coast internet marketing group, right? So he's in this group, Allie Brown's in this group, so she's the West Coast side of things, right? And they're all learning these copywriting strategies and how do we bring them into the online world? Okay. So Dan is offline, Mark is online. Yannick then becomes friends with Mark, starts learning from and with Mark. They start JV conversating to each other. And then Russell Brunson comes into the scene and he's a disciple of both these folks too. Okay, so all of these folks are kind of bringing ultimately offline psychological hacks, right? Whether it's military hacks, whether it's direct sales hacks, whether it's neuro-linguistic programming and hypnosis, those folks are essentially the first to the game to say, ooh, here's this new tool where we can teach this at a, in a scaled way. Let's bring this online. Yes. And it costs way less because we don't have to, we don't have to pay postage because it's all just on the internet and you've got mail. Okay. Because didn't you say that ultimately like those early squeeze pages were essentially just these direct sales letters mm -hmm. that had been highlighted? They just took them and put them online. Yeah. Right. Basically, basically they followed the exact same format. Old direct mail sales letters were usually three to 10 pages long and they were selling something at the end. Maybe it was come eat at my restaurant. Maybe in the case of Bill Glazer, it was come into the shop and get a custom made suit, right? But it always started with a story, the date, the yellow highlighter, the you're not the only one, like the 12 steps to an effective sales page, right? Like this stuff goes way back. And over time on the internet, we got bored with and frustrated by the yellow highlighter and the dudes leaning on the Lambos, but this is where it started, right? These right. sales letters went from the offline world to the online world and then mm -hmm. it just you know propagated from there and essentially this is like the early form of clickbait because when we were doing our pre-show mm -hmm. uh, you were saying that mm -hmm. essentially these copywriting techniques that they were selling that they were teaching at yeah. the glazer kennedy inside circle is that what it was called yeah yeah, glazer, yeah. it's just <laughs> oh that these methods that they were teaching they were essentially saying, copy the tabloids. Yeah. So one of the one of the techniques that they taught was, you know, these sales letters work. So write them over and over again so that you learn them and understand how they work. Like just manually write them over and over again. That's how you become a good copywriter. Copy other people's copy, right? <laughs> so if you want to be a good copywriter, look to the places where copy is really working. You want really good headlines? Go to the tabloids and see what the tabloids are saying. And if those papers are selling, those headlines are working. You want to know if an ad is an effective ad? You go to the back of the tabloid and you look to see, oh, I've seen that ad in 17 issues of this tabloid. It must be working or they wouldn't have the money to keep running that ad. So let me pull that page and let me put that in my swipe file. That's where that whole term comes from, right? We're going to swipe these ideas from mm. tabloid marketing, from you know, all of these offline newspaper worlds, because that's, that's what they had. They had offline and then they were starting to bring it online. And so it's guys like Mark Joyner and Yannick Silver, who was a disciple of Dan Kennedy, but it really started with Dan Kennedy that start to bring this stuff into the online world for the masses to consume. Obviously what we know to be copywriting is your writing ad copy. You are writing mm -hmm. sales copy. But what you're telling mm -hmm. me about these early, even pre-internet copywriting mastermind circles is that what they were literally teaching was to be a copywriter here, just copy this and write it over and over again. And eventually it'll absorb into your brain. Yep. 
That yep. is wild. And you know what? This reminds me of one of my favorite things to do on the weekends is go antiquing. And I'm always on the hunt for magazines and newspapers as early as I can get them. And some of them, I've, I've found some newspapers going back to the 1800s. And lo and behold, you want to talk about copying the methods that come out of the tabloids. Well, if I go back to the 1800s, I'm finding work from home schemes, get rich, make $10,000, make $10,000 back at a time where $10,000 was equivalent to like $100,000, right? It was or, like- Or a million, yeah. I yeah. invested two pennies in the stock market and today I'm a millionaire. Back when that was a massively big claim. And just to get in another little B-school dig, because this is the B in my bonnet, the B in my bonnet is B-school. I just found last weekend, I found a psychology magazine from the 1920s that really was just the psychology of messing with people's heads so that you can make a bunch of money off of them. But in this psychology magazine, I found a bunch of ads that essentially were the exact copy of Marie Forleo's Get Anything You Want or Make Any Man Want You, which were some of her, like still to this day, I believe one of those is her lead magnet. That's how she gets you to give you her email address so you can get into her click funnel, into her dick funnel. Um, but I found ads going back to the 1920s about how to get anything you want, right? And so this blew my mind. There is nothing new under the sun. So what you're telling us, taking us all the way from the 1800s back to the is that the early glazer kennedy insider circle they were teaching copywriting by saying first just take these old sales letters and copy them a hundred times like bart simpson on the chalkboard like i will not scam my way to millions i will not scam, except you, you will but then also they were saying go and read the tabloids go and read the national inquirer and see the style yeah and the newsletter that they sell because they sent out a, a monthly newsletter would have examples of members effective sales copy. Here's a copy of Pete's sales letter. He was selling pizza for his restaurant and you know he had an increase of 20%. And so here's the sales letter he used. And so people would actively submit their entries to get featured in this newsletter so that these people in these chapters all over the country would get to see their stuff at work and implement it. That led eventually to, you know, like annual conventions and those kinds of things, very MLM like that. Like, let's have an annual convention, propaganda, right? That whole propaganda thing. Well, so Russ Brunson. Russell, let's call him Russell. So people remember, you call him Russ, like you're his old friend. Russ, I'm not his old friend. I'm not, I think I, I, think I did interview him once way, 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 way back. But okay, so this is a kid who loved junk mail. So he was a disciple of direct mail marketing, the the Columbia house, get it for a penny, you know, any of the junk mail that came. And he's told this story, like he loved this stuff and he soaked it up, right? So when he had the opportunity to learn about marketing from a Dan Kennedy, from a Yannick Silver, from a Mark Joyner, he was soaking it all up. But he was also very smart about psychology and the, the development of the funnel. So he created this piece of software that eventually became ClickFunnels that he showed to Mark Joyner. And Mark was like, the student has become the teacher, like this whole thing. And so he starts promoting Russell Brunson as one of my first mentors who really taught me a whole lot. This is Russell talking. You know, I, I've learned a lot from him, but it becomes this cross pollinating relationship because Mark's sitting on a list of a million or so subscribers at the time. I don't know what it is now. And Russ is basically just getting his funnel software off the ground. You know, he's teaching how to do an effective webinar and those kinds of things. So he's capitalizing on Mark's audience as a greenhorn who's really learned a lot from Simpleology and, you know, helped grow his business through the things that he learned in the programs that Mark, Mark was teaching, like mind control marketing and, and those kinds of things. And so he's got that training under his belt, but he's also a disciple of this world of direct mail marketing, the Yannick Silver, Dan Kennedy's of the world. So he's getting it from both sides. And he's just assimilating it. So the dude is smart, terribly effective, right? The dude is smart and he gets to the point where he can get blood out of a stone because he understands all of these different trigger points to, in his words, make sure no pennies are left on the table, like, like get every penny that's due to you, leave nothing on the table. And I'm like, sometimes the stuff on the table isn't yours to take, bro. So Russell Brunson learns mind control marketing from Mark Joyner. This is foreshadowing for him down the line. And he learns tabloid copy tactics from Dan Kennedy and Yannick mm -hmm. Silver. And then he himself is a student of junk mail. And he synthesizes what he's learned from those folks. Puts it all And online. turns it into his own dick funnel Frankenstein, the early dick funnel prototype. Didn't he get his start with an ebook for a potato gun? Wasn't 
in his like early offer that he sold an ebook on eBay, I believe, back before he built his software. That's what brought him into Mark's world, right? Like right. he he was taking the direct mail knowledge that he had and writing great copy on eBay to sell his potato gun, but he really wanted to, to do something online. And that's where he started to work with Mark and, and study Mark's tactics. And that's when he saw the And potential. that's when Dick Funnels was born. Click Funnels for the uninitiated. Dick Funnels, if we're calling it what it really is. Okay, we've gone from talking about prosperity gospel, masterminds, JV relationships and affiliates. And now we've kind of shifted gears over into the mind control marketing, the direct sales approach to marketing, both of those things being brought online. And Dan Kennedy, as you're outlining here, was teaching this kind of tactic tabloid approach to copywriting, which ultimately paved the way to what would ultimately become clickbait, right? Taking this National Enquirer inspired approach to copy and turning it into what, how can we write a headline that plays on urgency, that plays on people's pain points, that plays on people's curiosity gap of, oh, I want to learn how, how Bat Boy found his way out of the cave. Oh, you're telling me that this yep. mermaid was born underwater and now has become a, right? Coming right. out of that desire to see the unbelievable, that's what- Well, and the fear of missing out. The two biggest triggers, goes back to a lot of what they taught in, in their, their copy. The two biggest triggers are this fear of missing out, but also shame. Shame is like the mm. number one trigger. And it's why you see so many of these internet marketers using shame tactics to get you to buy. There was a time where I won't remember his name, so I'm not even going to try. He had sent an email to his list saying, you guys need to buy my thing because it's amazing. Like they always do. And when nobody bought, he sent a follow-up email going, how stupid can you be? I can't believe that you wouldn't take me up on this amazing offer. And I'm like, did that actually work? Because I wouldn't have bought from you if you had humiliated me like that in an email. But it did. He got people to buy. I mean, a lot of people clicked away, but I mean, that was really the beginning of this whole, let's shame our people into buying from us and make them feel, I mean, it, it starts to, you start to develop these cult personalities, right? Like, I can humiliate you because you are so wrapped in my world. You will do whatever I say. And if you don't, then that makes you a loser. Which ties back to what we were talking about before with the think and grow rich mindset, mind cure culture mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. it's in your head. There's yeah. something wrong with you. You're the problem. You need to, yeah. Only I can sell you the cure for your diseased mindset. And yeah. so, okay. So you've got the shame and the pain points. You know, you even see this today when you're like opting out of, you get a pop-up come up on your screen to sign up for somebody's ebook. And then the shame based button at the bottom will be something like, no, I don't want to make a million dollars. No, I want to die in obscurity. No, I would prefer to languish in poverty instead of downloading this ebook. I mean, I'm exaggerating for the point of comedy, but, but, but not by much because I mean, the same thing happens when you go to unsubscribe. Are you sure you want to uns unsubscribe? Yes, unsubscribe me or no, I want to stay around or no, I, that's okay. I'd rather be poor and, and miserable and, and live my poor broke Ms. life, right? And they know that shame works. And, and I think, and this is where I get into that, that gray area nuance. So much of marketing lacks nuance. And I think there is a point where a smidgen of shame that opens your eyes can be effective. But when you start turning the thumb screws and poking at it and digging at it, that's when you've gone into manipulation. That's when you've gone into causing harm. And I say this because I can't control what you feel immediately, right? I can write copy that might have you feel, oh, Ooh, that I feel called out by that. Oh yeah, that got me in the feels. That's different than I got you in the feels and now I'm going to rake you over those coals that Tony wants right. you to walk over, right? Like that's, that's the difference. And I would add to this, something that I see that, that bothers me is when people sell their ethical marketing courses or when people are talking about ethical marketing, they will often say speaking to pain points is inherently unethical, right? Because this is, you know, the problem with so many ethical marketing courses, in my opinion, is that they're essentially just offering a this, not that approach, swapping someone else's formula with what they have deemed an ethical formula. And one of right. these too good to be true, easy swaps is the idea that appealing to pain points in any way, shape or form is inherently wrong. Now I disagree with that because in my opinion, you know, a business and its solutions exist to typically do one, two, or both things. One is you're there to solve a problem, right? right? So I like to use the example of if I'm a flood mitigation company, right? If my basement floods and I need somebody to come up and pump out a bunch of water, that's what the business model is based on is, yeah. is, is solving a problem. There really isn't 
any way to to communicate that you can help me solve that problem without talking about a pain point, right? Like, right. you know, so there's that's one type of business. The other business is instead of solving a problem directly, it's helping me achieve some sort of a desired outcome. So that's going to be more future focused. That's going to be more positive. Most businesses do both, right? If I, yeah. I am going to get the, the water out of my basement so that I can enjoy my beautiful home again, I can work, whatever. But just to preach to people that speaking to a pain point or that speaking to a desire that somebody has for an outcome that might invoke a feeling of shame is inherently unethical. That's the part that I don't agree with. There's a difference between addressing and communicating, hey, I know you might have a problem that I can help you solve and coming in and saying, I am going to manufacture and then agitate shame and pain that my audience doesn't even know they exist yet. I'm going to invent the shame essentially for them. I'm going to create this artificial FOMO so that you feel right. let me let me make you feel like shit for the problem that you have and that you haven't been smart enough to figure it out yet and then I'm here to rescue you and this is why the only reason I said yes to this interview is because we're naming names in context right we're not saying that person is bad we're not even saying everything that they do is bad necessarily it's this tactic when it's taken in this way becomes very problematic, harmful, and can be bad, you know? But to your example, when I'm, I work with people who are creatives who are like, but I don't solve a problem. I'm like, no, not necessarily. Maybe you're a luxury brand or maybe you're doing something that helps make their life better. So we can talk about pain points from a perspective of how does it make their life better? How does what you do or what you offer make their life or their work better? or even better in the case of serving a delight versus solving for a pain. But sometimes we have to talk about a pain point because the pain is all they know. They can't even begin to imagine what life might be like on the other side because it hurts so much where they are right now. So we have to say, I know you've got the scratching, scratching, itching and burning. I know it, right? I want to help you with it. But that's different than saying you've got the scratching, itching and burning because you're a friggin' idiot and you don't know what to do. So let me come rescue you. All right, and let me just, 10x the sensation of scratching, itching, and burning. Right, right. To the point where you can't do anything else but click for the solution. And that's why this isn't about swapping out, don't do this, do that instead. If only it was that easy. And this is the, the... the challenge that I have with folks essentially coming out of one school of marketing and saying, oops, I'm not going to do it anymore. That's the sleazy way. Follow me for my 10 easy steps to be ethical. No, because the individual, first of all, ethics are in the eye of the beholder, right? We don't Mm -hmm. actually have a shared collective ethic. If we did... If you were to look at our shared collective ethics, we have the ethics of capitalism, which is profit over people at any cost, right? Right. But right. but ethics are very subjective. They're very individual. So I can't assign to you what your you know version of an ethical business would be. But also because of individualization, because each person is coming into the game, as you've said, with their own advantages, and each of those va- advantages has different levels of privilege. And yeah, and on and on and on, right? And people have their own audiences and their unique business models. There just is no way to prescribe across the board one solution that's going to work for everybody. And yet that's what these folks did. Let's go back to number five on our list, which was the tabloid clickbait, pain point, shame-based marketing. The Dan Kennedys of the world, who begat the Russell Brunsons of the world, right? They are selling the myth that there is an easy formula or an easy software. Oh, we're going to leave you hanging there. This concludes part two of the online business family tree. In parts three and four, we show how the boy bosses like Mark Joyner, Dan Kennedy, Yannick Silver, and Russell Brunson helped Tony Robbins bring the girl bosses like Marie Forleo, Amy Porterfield, and Jenna Kutcher into this mad marketing mix. And how celebrity personal brands like the ones I just named leverage their relatability to build parasocial bonds with their audience that they then convert into cold hard cash. See you in part three. If you want more marketing muckraking and brand strategy gone wild, I invite you to subscribe to this show. And if you enjoyed it, leave me a review. That really helps me out. If you hated it, please send it to your enemies. They sound like good people. You can go to rachelkalbers.com slash subscribe to get these updates in your inbox. And because this show is self-sponsored, if you wanted to support my work, you can go to buymearobe.com. That's where the magic happens. In the meantime, remember, it's not the age of the niche. It's the age of the wildcard bitch. See you on the internet.